At the end of the summer, state education officials released preliminary results from the statewide tests administered during the 2023-2024 school year. Similar to last year, less than half of students in grades 3 through 8 were deemed proficient in English, and just over half demonstrated proficiency in mathematics, while about a third of kids in grades 5 and 8 achieved proficiency on science tests. Starting last year, the state began using a so-called next-generation model for scoring English and math tests, which is supposed to allow for a more nuanced approach to determining proficiency. To discuss the latest results and how the information should be used moving forward, we're joined in the Capitol Press Room by State Education Commissioner Betty Rosa. Welcome back to the show, Commissioner. Thank you. And we're also joined by Zach Warner, Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Assessment in the State Education Department. Thanks for making the time, Zach. Glad to. Thank you. So I guess for starters, what, if anything, stands out to you from the preliminary testing data that I mentioned in the introduction, uh, those top line numbers? You know, the key issue for us is always transparency and transparency about explaining the process that we use. And obviously, we are very focused on what gets used at the district level, school level and classroom level and student specific level. So I do want to say that in June, schools and teachers were given information about student performance, right? So that's that's what I, you know we call the at the macro level, and the issue was to connect that information, the teachers connecting that information with the questions that we use in terms of standards, so that schools at the end of the school year, right, are looking at the progress and looking at the students individually in that classroom, as well as within the school. And then using very quickly, using the summer to design curriculum, teaching strategies and focus, and to evaluate from a district school, as I said, class, and do some professional development. So, and then we go into data certification process. So I wanted to contextualize that because a lot of times they'll say, why are we getting these reports and X? versus, you know, when we should be working with them at the end of the school year. The important thing also is the different audiences that the test uh, results serve. So back in June, that primary audience is the teacher in the school to say, how can we program for this student? How can we support them? And they can start to think about curricular decisions and next year's placement decisions. What we're talking about after the fact is both that individual student score report that's going home to mom, dad, guardian, and saying, hey, based on these learning standards, this is where your student ended up for this grade. And that also allows you to have conversations about, okay, so I see a math, we're gonna need a little bit of extra help, or wow, in our reading, we're knocking it out of the park. This is great, I look forward to that. And we also then have these uh, statewide numbers, which are used for federal purposes to report what does equity look like across our state, Where can we divert resources as a state education department, offer support, and uh, work directly with those schools to make sure all students are achieving? So it's, it's different results for different audiences, and they have been rolling out since June. You know, at the end of the day, it's really important to understand each component. And again, the purpose of these exams, this is only one aspect to measure how students master the learning standards. Okay, so that's a lot of context, but (laughs) let's get back to the original question, which is what, if anything, do these top line numbers mean to you? Is it the case where you dismiss the top line numbers because they're not necessarily as meaningful as uh, the district by district or student by student results? Or is there something that you take away from the statewide numbers? And if so, what is it? You know, when we think about a composite, this is one measure. So absolutely, we do not dismiss. They inform the connection of how students master the learning standards, but not in in a way that this is the absolute, right? No, and I get that, Commissioner. But what I was saying is, these numbers in particular, what do they mean to you? Because if it was, say, 90% proficient, I imagine we'd be having a parade. If it was 0% proficient, we'd be having a school emergency declaration by the governor. So what do these numbers in particular mean? And maybe it's nothing. Maybe you really 
don't have any major takeaways from these numbers. Oh, we do. For me, the numbers are only as important as I can contextualize them and use them for professional development, for support. Okay, use and that's them. what I guess what I'm I'm getting to is like, so you, right. you were talking about those numbers that can be used kind of at the local level for that type of support. Right. So and it sounds like at the statewide thing. level, it feels like there's not necessarily a big takeaway from these oh. large numbers. Because if, it's, if it's, that's not the case, how, how do you use the, those numbers at the statewide level? And if sure. you do use them, how do you use, say, 35% for proficiency in science for grades five and eight? Dave, one way I think I'd look at it is there's the numeric ESCOL and then there's, there's the so what. And I think I could try to talk a little bit about the, the so what. And I, as, as you can tell, Commissioner and I don't want to boil down the so what into one type thing that you can take away from here. But the one thing you can take away is, yes, about half of students on that day in April achieved that. So now what do we do with that? From a statewide level, we look at it and say, OK, there must be places where those 50% of students that did not achieve proficiency live. So where are those places? And that gets into some of the breakout. And for that local data, has any of that been made available to the public or state policymakers, like local legislators, or is it mostly still in the hands of school districts and parents? The data you're asking about in terms of can anyone log on and see it, that's coming forward in what we call the state report card. And that's where everything is put together for one-stop shopping. We have not only these test results, but we also have the demographic data of the schools. We have the graduation rates of the district. So everything will be coming out in the fall as part of that state report card, which, which wraps that full context. So in trying to understand the data, is there any shortcomings in the actual collection of it? For example, is there an ability for kids to like opt out of these tests so that the numbers aren't completely representative? Or, or do you feel like the broader trends that emerge are based on good data with these tests? After COVID, we've really engaged in the kinds of conversations that, yes, this has a purpose. Don't dismiss it, you know, for, both for parents and for, you know, for other individuals that are invested in this work. And what we want to try to do is have multiple sources of information to inform our work. The test results have value for the students to take them at any level. At the same time, when you are able to aggregate those to other levels, you can make other interpretations. So if the majority of students in your classroom as the teacher take them, well, we can probably make some interpretations about learning in your classroom. The same for your school, for your district, and at the statewide. So while we have had um, not everyone participate, we still feel very comfortable at the state level saying, yes, this is a good, solid trend because we have the vast majority of students. Well, more specifically then, were there any substantial number of opt-outs from the test year results we've been talking about? And if there was, how does it impact some of those larger trends about proficiency that we're trying to talk about? I think we have a general number, right? I don't think we've come to the actual number. That's correct, Commissioner. So yeah. uh, we're letting schools certify these data. And what happens is they'll go in and say, hey, look, Zach didn't have a test score. So they will sometimes have to go in and say, oh, is that because Zach refused the test or because he was sick that day? We have a general number. It appears to be notable, and, and I, I couldn't even put a percentage on it, but it is, it is more than one or two percent. You know, New York has a history of having 15 percent or so. We do believe it's a little lower this year. So, David, it's the same thing. Uh, but here's what we can do. Obviously, we're going to get to that data information. In some cases, it is um, an opt-out, and in other cases, it's not. It's the kid was just out. Uh, and they've got to go through those as well. So this is cleanup time and more than glad to come back to you once we have um, the data that is really reflective of the work that we, we're doing during this period of time. But we didn't want to wait, you know, till that's ready. And we said, you know, we'll do this. We'll definitely do this focusing on, you know, on the process, focusing on what these trends are and how we 
as a state, use that information to really support our districts in terms of their work. I guess my final question would be, as you look at the statewide numbers, which are the numbers that we have, what do you think of as the time horizon for making substantive improvements in proficiency? Is this something where you look at this in a year-to-year -year time frame, or is this something where it's a longer horizon? So, um, and again, to put back into context, we have a TAC. You know, we meet with with our advisors and these are all sacrometricians, right? I think we have a meeting coming up pretty soon. Uh, and what we do is to, you know, to your question, we look at year to year, it's, it's a yearly crop. These are the students for that year, right? Next year, it's a different uh, group of students. But we also look at those trends. The kid who was in fourth grade now is in fifth. How is the fifth grade looking? So we look at information across the board, but we also take into account the fact that we have a brand new test. Uh, we have, you know, the science standards, obviously, you, you know, we're, we're looking at that as, as we're moving forward. Um, and so for us, it's, it's year to year, but it's also looking at it as a trend lines and then also looking at all the information and how it's informing the way we as a state are responding to this information. How, what are the kinds of things that we're doing again to um, support our districts, our schools, but just as important, how are the districts using them to inform their work? Because obviously the, you know, the, the local level responses by district creates the composite as well, right? So we, you know, we really truly want to look at um, the specific issues, as I said, with our ling English language learners. How are they, how are they performing? You know, so we zoom in on those. What about our students with special needs? We zoom in on those. So the information informs us year to year, but it also informs us across the board and, and trends. As Commissioner said, there's immediate work to do. One of the academic intervention services, AIS, is one thing mm -hmm. where we ask to see where a student is and make immediate determinations mm -hmm. about if they need to change the student's programming and offer support. That's an immediate thing that will be done every year and impact those students immediately. At the same time, we want to look for trends across as we see new curricula rolling out, new learning standards becoming familiar and say, you know, how are we being responsive in those areas? So it's very much what can we do in the short term and where do we need to go in the long term to have a, a deeper vision. Well, unfortunately, we've got to leave it there. We've been speaking with State Education Commissioner Betty Rosa. Commissioner, thanks so much for making the time. Thank you. And we hope to be back soon. And we've also been speaking with Zach Warner, Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Assessment in the State Education Department. Thank you, Zach. Thank you. And for more Capitol Press Room conversations, visit capitalpressroom.org or find the show wherever you get podcasts. And if you are listening to the podcast, leave us a rating or review as it helps other people discover the program. Support for the Capitol Press Room provided by the New York State AFL-CIO, a federation of 3,000 unions fighting for working people by keeping New York State union strong. Visit unionstrongny.org for more information. Join us again for Capitol Press Room, a production of WCNY Connected, Syracuse.